Dr. Amara Khalid is the CEO and founder of RIA Psychological Services. She's a clinical psychologist and has been practicing in Chicago for over a decade. She did her bachelor's from NYU in psychology and gender and sexuality, and her master's and doctorate from the Illinois School of Professional Psychology in clinical psychology, focusing on marriage and family therapy, as well as diversity and multi multicultural issues. Dr. Khalid sees clients from all walks of life, from age four to 84, and believes in helping clients heal and empower themselves and their communities. She sees clients for anxiety, depression, trauma, relationships, and many other concerns and issues. Dr. Khalid, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it is exciting to have you here because as you know, the Find Me the Money podcast is really about divorce and money, but we also cover a variety of other topics that are related to divorce in the podcast. And I wanted to talk with you about mental health during divorce because I just don't think this topic gets enough attention. There's so much happening during divorce from the kids to the finances to dividing the house. And it's really easy to forget about the emotional toll and forget about taking care of yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, I see clients both in early stages of divorce, you know, when there's a lot of shock, betrayal, there's so much physical stress too, you know, your sleep changes, your appetite changes, you're sort of in that fight or flight mode. And sometimes you may even be in denial and you're struggling with anger. Um, all the way through the later stages of divorce where the depression starts to set in and you feel heavy. There may be chronic fatigue. The bills are piling up. Financial issues with paying the lawyers, trying to figure out custody arrangements. There's also a big component of identity shifts, right? Like as you get used to the idea of being a divorcee, what does that mean? And how does that shift our story? So I talk to clients about some of the relational distress they feel during this time with their families, their kids, with job, um, you know, and how to really create a new narrative, whether you've been divorced for, from a marriage that lasted five years, whether it's a marriage that lasted 25 years. Uh, I think we all need to kind of think about ways in which we reinvent ourselves after such a big, big loss. And of course, there's grief and loss. You know, and we have to move through the stages of that, too. You specialize in divorce and breakup recovery. I would love for you to tell me a little bit about what that means. Mm -hmm. So as a systemic therapist, I talk to clients about their context. This means their family of origin. It means how we internalize the messages from different sources, how we create our stories, what are all of the different components of our identity, whether we come from majority culture, minority culture, different marginalized identities, and really understanding, you know, where do we develop a sense of self? Where do we feel a sense of belonging? Where do we feel othered? And when talking to clients about breakup and divorce recovery, you know, there's obviously such a big sense of grief and loss that comes with that. And I know this personally, having been divorced myself at one point, um, it can be shocking. It can be, you know, so upsetting for multiple reasons. And for example, in my South Asian community, there's still a lot of shame and stigma around the idea of being divorced. So people have a very hard time talking about it. And this leads to one of the most common issues I see, which is loneliness, right? Not only have you lost your partner, but you also feel lonely because there may be shame and stigma around talking about the feelings, talking about the divorce, whether it's with friends, with family. And so divorce can be a really, really isolating and lonely experience. And I really encourage people to find a therapist that they trust, find a community, find friends, find people that they can talk to and, and other divorcees they can talk to as well. What are some of the typical mental health concerns that someone would come to you expressing? So one of the things that I talk to my clients about is 
self-care. And I know this term is used all the time, right? We hear self-care in terms of bubble baths and boundaries and boxing class. Self-care is, it can be a lot of different things for a lot of different people, but it's really about coming back to the basics of managing your distress, your emotional reaction, especially if the divorce process is taking long. I mean, you know the ups and downs that can happen in someone's mood day to day. Um, and with something like a divorce, you know, it can be so jarring in multiple ways because there can be unexpected twists and turns. And then you get this letter from your lawyer and all of a sudden you're like, I wasn't prepared for this or this isn't what we agreed upon. Um, custody battles that can you know, wage out in the courtroom for years and years and, and there's money just being hemorrhaged. I mean, that's a lot of stress. So I think what I help clients is working out sort of a short-term self-care plan, but also a long-term self-care plan because we just don't know how long sometimes this process will take. And one of the things that I help clients come up with, especially when there's so much you know, financial infidelity or betrayal involved is a financial emotional self check. So this involves several components. For example, you have to know your own family history with money. How was money talked about in your family growing up? What were the rules spoken or unspoken? What were the messages you received about spending and saving? you know, our relationship with money can also be a very emotional one. And it can show up in different ways. For example, do you come from a family that has a scarcity mindset, right? There's never enough. We always have to save. We always have to work hard and squirrel our money away because there's never enough. And we always have to save for a rainy day. I see this a lot with immigrant clients, for example, that have had to face certain hardships. Versus the idea of an abundance mindset, like there will always be enough, you will be okay. And even if you're not right now, there's plenty to go around, you'll find your way through it. So some of these messages that we grow up with really shape our attitudes towards money and towards finances during a divorce. And of course, there's the whole, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but power and control when it comes to finances, because if you are financially dependent on your spouse and now they're no longer in the picture, how are you supporting yourself? Was the money a way to exert control and power over you, over the children? You know, um, and we can explore gender dynamics there. We So I really help clients unpack all of this because there's so many messages and on some level people are aware of them and on many levels we're not, but there's stories that we tell ourselves about our relationship with money and relationship with divorce and recovery and what that means, you know, and there's so many other components to, you know, when are people ready to date? You know, when do you still believe in love? You know, what does it mean to be a single parent? Um, can you do that successfully? Do you have a support system? And, you know, when I work with couples that are either in the divorce process or have divorced, but are trying to figure out co-parenting strategies, I really help them come together about, you know, okay, the relationship may have ended, but you're still co-parenting for these children. So can you still work together as a team? Are there ways to present a united front so that they're not getting mixed messages? And how can we do what's in their best interest without causing much harm to each other or, or to the kids? If I'm in the process of divorce and I feel there's a big weight on my shoulders with all of this going on, how am I going to identify that I need the services of a therapist? I, I really have to get some professional help to help me manage this. Are there some clues, some signs I could look for? I think being able to track your mood and being aware of you know, your sleep, your appetite, these are all things that go out the window when our body's in a state of distress. And I understand that therapy may not be available to everyone. And so finding that community resource and support is great. Um, there's lots of local agencies like the Lilac Tree in Chicago is one. Um, a lot of my South Asian clients go to Upnaghar, 
uh, which is a domestic violence shelter for South Asian women, but they also have a lot of legal uh, resources for women that are struggling with divorce issues and immigration issues. So some coping strategies that I suggest are, you know, finding community, finding support, understanding that loneliness is harder than, you know, all of this financial stress. And sometimes we have a tendency to isolate ourselves even further when going through divorce. And I think that's a big red flag. If you start to notice that you're kind of moving away from your friends, moving away from your family, not taking much interest, much enjoyment in the things that used to bring you joy. These are all signs. Um, sometimes there's shame and stigma around divorce and, and money and even seeking therapy. There might still be sort of this taboo feeling about, oh no, do I go to therapy? Sometimes clients are reluctant to go to therapy in the middle of a divorce because they don't want it to be used in the court proceedings. And I understand that. And I think there's lots of different challenges with that too. But finding ways to journal, practice grounding exercises, becoming more attuned with your physical, emotional reactions. There's so many uh, mindfulness apps like Headspace and Calm that you can use as a way to cope, you know. And I think for folks that are trying to divorce and working on co-parenting, there's so much to talk about when it comes to the division of unpaid labor, carrying the mental load, uh, going through court custody agreements. And sometimes I think we get stuck in, you know, what's fair and what's unfair. And any judge or lawyer will tell you that, you know, that it's, it's really not about what's fair or unfair. It's just trying to get two people to agree to, to an arrangement that may feel unfair to both of them. Um, and I know that people have different emotional responses to their spouses or to their spouses, lawyers, and it's a very emotionally laden, burdensome period. And so being able to check in with yourself is really important. Um, and when it comes to finding a therapist, I really think it's so important to find a good fit. This is such an important relationship, you know, and so you want to find someone you trust, someone that makes you feel comfortable, someone that may even challenge you a little bit. But don't be afraid to shop around and find the right fit because this is such a crucial relationship and you want to have somebody that will hold the space for you as you're working out all of the different emotions and, and stages of grief during this time. What would you say is the most common struggle that you see amongst your clients who are in the process of divorce? So again, I kind of separate between early stages of divorce and later stages of divorce. So early stages, I see sometimes people just stuck in denial or they're so angry and they're looking for some kind of verdict or some, you know, they're kind of stuck in this blame game and it's okay to be there. It's okay to feel anger, even rage. You know, I welcome it. But recognize ways in which it keeps us stuck, because I think that's something that people lose sight of in the early stages. And in the later stages, we're dealing more with just the loss, the feelings of grief, the depression that comes with it, um, you know, questioning, who am I now without this person? Or what does it mean that I got divorced? And how do I face my family and f uh, friends or people at work? How do I talk to my kids? How would, how do I navigate this? Because there's no one blueprint that anyone can follow. And I think there's so much advice out there that you really have to cherry pick and use a little bit of discernment because not everything out there is going to apply to you. Not everything will apply to you as a co-parent. Not everything will apply to you in terms of legal advice. So you have to kind of gauge, okay, what's helpful and what's unhelpful advice and how can I stay away from the unhelpful advice? There's a lot of divorce support groups out there on the internet and I keep an eye on them because I want to know what issues people are interested in, things like that. And so there's a lot of advice that happens there. And on the one hand, I feel like it's great to create community because divorce is so isolating and it's really helpful to hear that you're not alone. 
on the other hand, there's so much noise. There's so much conflicting advice. There's people who will make you feel even worse than you already feel. And so it can really be a little bit of a minefield as well. Absolutely. And I think that, again, finding the right therapist is important because the therapist will help you get connected to resources. I've helped women find groups, whether they were online or in person. Um, sometimes there's workshops, sometimes there's seminars. There's so many different options out there. And if you have a therapist who has been doing this work, they'll know how and where to connect you. Okay, so my favorite topic, as you know, is money. And I talk about financial infidelity a lot. So I would love for you to tell us, as a therapist, what you see in this area. I think similar to other kinds of infidelity, financial infidelity also feels like a betrayal. And, you know, there's real palpable heartache associated with that because here's someone you trusted in your marriage as a partner and they've betrayed you. I've had clients that um, had spouses that were hiding gambling addictions for years and had, without their knowledge, you know, taken out such second mortgages on the house. And um, one uh, one woman I remember working with, she was devastated because all the savings for their children's college funds had been used in this gambling addiction. And she was just so distraught because she said that, you know, this was taking money away from the children and their future. So I think there's so many layers at, uh, of you know, infidelity and betrayal when it comes to something like this. And depending on what the arrangement had been during the marriage, whether people had separate accounts or accounts together, how much was shared, how much was revealed. And sometimes this, you know, some of these investigations, as I'm sure you know, take years because there's so much that's happened over time that we have to keep pe peeling back the layers and discover, oh, this happened three years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, so there's a lot of shock and there sometimes can be a tendency to self-blame, like, oh no, where, where were these red flags? Why didn't I look more mm -hmm. closely into it? You know, a, a lot of people struggle with this idea of, oh, if only I had known and if only I had done this and that, and I really have to disabuse them of these myths because nobody has a crystal ball no one could see this coming. You know, sometimes the signs right. are there and sometimes people are great at hiding stuff. And there's well, and no bad way. behavior is bad behavior, whether or not you are able at that time to see it yourself. You cannot be held responsible for that other person's behavior. Right. Right. And if they're not blaming themselves, they may have family and friends that are blaming them. Oh, you should have seen this coming. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you look into that? So it's really important to find a way out of that negative state because that can be just debilitating for a person's self-esteem self-worth okay as we're wrapping up i would love for you to tell me what starting therapy is going to look like for someone what they should be expecting what they should be prepared for i think most therapists will do a fairly standard intake to begin with one of the things that i do even before an intake is i offer a free 15 minute phone consultation because I want you to get to know me, have an opportunity to ask questions before you decide you want to work with me. And I think it's okay to ask about, you know, what is the therapist's approach? What is their style? For example, I take a very collaborative approach. I don't think I'm the expert in the room on your life. I'm not going to tell you what to do and what not to do, but I want us to work together to achieve the goals that you have in mind for yourself. So you know, it, it starts by just getting to know you, getting your history and identifying your goals and, and making sure that we're, you know, achieving those goals short term and long term. I think that you have made therapy feel very accessible. I think that you uh, bring some comfort to the process. It feels like it would be very easy to talk with you and work with you and that you truly do have the client's best interest in heart. So I think you've got a fantastic practice and I think your clients are really lucky to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Okay. So if people wanted to work with you, because I know that you do virtual work, where can our listeners find you? So my website is www.riapsychologicalservices.com. They can find my bio there and ask me questions, and I'm happy to schedule a free phone consultation. They can also find me at Instagram, and my handle is at dr.amarahalit, and I have videos and posts that are just on various topics of in mental health. Um, especially on breakup and divorce recovery. Like I said, I'm very open about my own experience having gone through my divorce myself. And so, you know, I really just want to help help clients find a way to talk about these things. And if I'm not the right fit, I'm happy to refer you to somebody else. I'm very well connected in the Chicago area. And I also see people across the states because I'm psyched back. So I'm able to see people in 35 different states across the nation. Wow. Well, we are going to put links in the show notes so everyone is able to find you. Thank you, Dr. Khalid, for being here with us today. Such a great conversation. Thank you.